recorded history of the children of Israel in 1 Samuel. If you would navigate and turn your way to the 16th chapter, Dr. Branch says a word from the Lord beginning in verse number 1. The 16th chapter, 1 Samuel. That reads a little something as follows. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn over Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. For I am sending you to Jesse the Bethlehemite. For I have provided myself a king from among his sons. Samuel answered and said, Lord, how can I go? If Saul hears of it, he will kill me. The Lord answered and said, take a heifer with you. And say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Then invite Jesse to the sacrifice. And I will show you what you will do for me. You will anoint for me the one I named to you. So Samuel did as the Lord said and went to Bethlehem. In that very first verse, the Lord said to Samuel, how long will you mourn over Saul? Seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and go. How long will you mourn over Saul? Seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel. How long will you mourn over Saul? Do me a favor, if you would, I want you to play preacher tonight. And simply look at the neighbor on your left or your right. Tell the neighbor, neighbor. Oh, neighbor. Oh, neighbor. I don't know what you're going through. I don't and I'm not trying to get in your business. I'm but I got a word for you. Get over it. Get over it. Get over it. Pastor DeVos, a few weeks ago, went to the doctor with some pain in my right knee. I assumed I had done some damage doing some squats in the gym, and I just wanted her to check things out. Went to see the doctor about some pain in my knee. She examined my knee, put me through a battery of tests, scheduled an MRI. Called me back three days later. She said, Reverend, I got some good news, and I got some bad news. Good news is you've done no real damage to your knee. You don't need surgery. The bad news You've got arthritis. I said, the devil is a liar. I'm only 44 years old. You don't get arthritis at 44. I asked him, Dr. Bax, I asked him, I said, well, if it's just arthritis, why does it hurt more today than it did yesterday? <laughs> this is what she said. Because it's going to rain. I'm going to tell you, you know you're getting older in life. When you can predict the weather without turning the television on. And I was mad that she had the audacity diagnosed me with arthritis. She said to me something that I've learned in these four years after 40. She said, Reverend, you must remember, life changes at 40. The handful of y'all that ain't made it yet, but for the rest of us that got it in the rearview mirror. Allow us just to testify that life changes at 40. At 40, Takes a little longer to get out of bed in the morning. But you sit on the edge and contemplate whether you really want to get up or not. At 40, some stuff hurts in the morning that didn't hurt at night. At 40, 
some stuff that used to live upstairs. <laughs> Moves downstairs. <laughs> Won't go back to where it's supposed to be. <laughs> Life changes at 40. Like Branch, at 40, you, you can't eat everything you used to eat late at night. Unless you and the Lord be up a long time <laughs> with prayerful meditations. My, my dad died at 80. And I recognize that at 40, I might be halfway through my life. So in my 40th birthday, I made some decisions about how I was going to live. At 40, I reached a place where I really decided, I don't care if you like me or not. At 40, I decided that, I'm, you know what, I'm just going to tell you what I think. Because I'm too grown and too old and life is too short for me to bite my tongue because you don't want to hear the truth. At 40, I decided that I didn't need Lottie Dottie and everybody in my life. I was carrying too much dead weight. So I left a recording on my voicemail on my phone. It went on something like this. You've reached my voicemail. I'm making some changes. If I don't call you back, you're one of them. At 40, I, I just decided I ain't going to let suntan folk run my blood pressure. I'm going to let you get underneath my skin and get on my nerves. I just look at you like you're crazy. Ain't nobody going to put me in my grave. So at 40, I made a decision. I'm just going to learn to be like Dorothy and the Wiz and ease on down the road. I don't get stressed out. I don't worry about stuff. I don't get frustrated. I learned to deal with all types of people and personalities. I've learned to deal with folk I like and I don't like. I've learned to pass the sheep and goats. Don't look at nobody. I've just learned to take it easy in life. But I come tonight to be honest with you that there is one segment of society that still gets on my last nerve. There's some folk that I can feel my blood pressure rising as I deal with them. One group of people that get underneath my skin and work my last good nerve. Now I need y'all to pray for me tonight because I got an issue with folk who don't know how to drive. <laughs> to get behind the wheel of a vehicle and have no understanding of common courtesy when you're driving. I don't like folks that see me wanting to merge on the highway and won't get one lane over to the left to let me get on. I got problems with you folk that get in the left lane and drive slow. The left lane for us who try to get somewhere if you ain't got nowhere to go, get over to the right. <laughs> Let me pass. I'm, I'm frustrated by folk. So when they see a sign that tells you this lane will close in a mile. <laughs> and you want to drive all the way up to the last inch and try to come. You ain't getting in front of me. Drive. One of my biggest pet peeves with drivers I experienced just a few weeks ago was at a stoplight behind a woman and the light turned green. She ain't moved. So I'm trying to be Christ-like and I sat there for a moment. She didn't move. 
I eased up on her bumper, thinking she'd see me in the rearview mirror. She didn't move. I waved my hand, hoping she'd look and see. She didn't move. I, I, I politely tapped my horn. She didn't move. And the light turned from green to yellow to red. And now I'm mad. Because I found out ain't nothing worse in life than being connected to someone who can't tell when it's time to move forward. Now, you ain't said amen because you think I'm talking about driving. I'm talking about life. Because life is filled with folk who are stuck in green lights. Folk who are paralyzed by the pain of their past. Won't move on when God says it's time to move into a new season of life. Life is filled with folks stuck in green lights. The church has some folk stuck in green lights. Somebody tonight is stuck at a green light. The reason I know it is because the Bible shares with us some folk who are stuck in green lights. One of them's name is Samuel. Yeah. To understand what goes on with Samuel in chapter 16, you got to rewind a few chapters. Yeah. So let me give you the background so you don't miss the breakdown, the context, so I don't lose you in the content. It all goes back to when the children of Israel demanded a king. Yeah. And against God's own deepest desire, he relents and gives them what they ask for. Yeah. God grants him a king by the name of Saul. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody who's been to Sunday school knows that from the giddy up and the beginning, yeah. Saul proves to be problematic. Yeah. He's got a predisposition to being disobedient. Yeah. Yeah. He's always doing what God told him not to do and not doing what God told him to do. Yeah. Yeah. Stuff comes to a head in 1 Samuel 15. Where in blatant disobedience to the commandment of God, Saul spares King Agag of the Amalekites and keeps the treasure of the Amalekites for the wealthy in Israel. And at the end of chapter 15, God says, that's it. I've had enough with Saul. And when you go home and read, you'll find out at the end of chapter 15, there are two tragedies. The first one is that the Bible says God is hmm, sorrowful that he ever chose Saul. The exact language is that the Lord regrets Saul. Do you hear the depth of divine disappointment? God says he regrets Saul. Beloved, there are a lot of things God's going to say about me. One thing I never want the Lord to do as he looks over my life is to regret blessing me. I don't want the Lord to regret favoring me. I don't want the Lord to regret giving me what I don't deserve. I want the Lord to look at me and say, well done. Thou yes. good and faithful servant. Yes. It's a shame for God to regret you. The Bible says not only does God regret Saul, but the end of chapter 15, it says that Samuel began to mourn over Saul. All right, all right. Now that is a reference to a particular Judeo-Hebraic custom of mourning when someone has died. Yeah. He puts on sackcloth, yeah. sits outside the city gates, mm. declares a season of sorrow and crying and pity and, and brokenness over Saul. Yeah. All right. The Lord shows up in the sunrise of chapter 16 Taps old Sam on the shoulder and says, Sam, I got a question for you. How long are you going to mourn over Saul? How long do you plan on crying over what happened? How long are you going to sit here pitiful and pathetic because things didn't go down the way you thought they should? How long are you going to look Toe up from the floor, busted and disgusted. Because your dreams didn't come true. How long do you plan on sitting here having a pity party for yourself and asking folks to walk by and cry with you simply because life didn't turn out the way you thought it would? How long will you mourn over Saul? Beloved, God's displeasure with Samuel is because God has already chosen the next king.
16. His name is David. And David is waiting down there in Bethlehem. And David can't begin his journey to be king until Samuel decides to anoint him with oil. And David's destiny is on hold. Israel's next season is on pause. All because one man is stuck at green light. Now, I really, I really don't know who I came to preach to on Tuesday night. But I'm sitting in your rearview mirror. And I'm easing up on your bumper. And I'm trying to wave in the mirror of your life. To point to the sign that God says it's time to move forward. No matter what you've been through. No matter what you've experienced. No matter what your past. The light has changed. And God is ready to do a new thing. Here's what he says to old Samuel and hear him whisper it in your life. He tells him three things. Right over there, verse number one, and I'm going to take my seat. He says, number one, Samuel, get over it. Somebody say, get over it. Watch, watch what's going on, y'all. The Lord shows up and Samuel is mourning over Saul. The challenge is, Saul ain't dead. He right here. How are you going to mourn over somebody who's still alive? That's a good question right there. I'll suggest to you the problem is not Samuel mourning over Saul. Samuel is mourning over his investment into Saul. Sunday school folk will remember that Everything Saul is, he owes to Samuel. Yeah. Samuel told him of God's call on his life. Yeah. Samuel taught him how to prophesy with the prophets. Yeah. Samuel called the church meeting and made the motion to elect him king. Samuel gave him wisdom and counsel when he didn't know what to do. Samuel was the one who told him about the will of God. Samuel has made an investment of himself in Saul. Yeah. And now he recognizes there will be no return on that investment. Come here, brother. Come here, sister. Ain't, ain't nobody got to die for you to get stuck in the green light. Just give your best and your all to something or someone and let it not turn out the way you thought it would. Well, I'm preaching somebody right now. You, you gave your all to that relationship. You thought it would lead you to the altar. Yeah. And it didn't bring you nothing but heartache. Yeah. You gave your best in that marriage thinking it would last till happily do ever after. Yeah. Only for it to wind up in divorce court. Yeah. You gave your all to that child hopeful that he would walk across a graduation stage and yet he's locked up wearing new orange and, and locked up with his hands. You, you gave your all to that job thinking that they would value you to the days of your retirement and they let you go when the next young person applied for the job. You gave your all to those friends thinking that if you were there for them, they would be there for you. But when the chips were down, they were nowhere to be found. Preacher, you gave your all to that church. The deacons never appreciated you. The trustees never voted on the vision. It hurts to give your all and get nothing. When you're giving your all and you've got nothing in return, you got to be careful because pride will keep you somewhere the Lord's trying to get you out of. Can I preach right here? Pride says, I've given too much to walk away empty hand. Pride says, I've been here too long for somebody to treat me like that. Prayer says, I, I, pride says I, I've served too much yeah. not to be recognized for my energy and my effort. Yeah. Pride says, when I met him, he wasn't no good. Yeah. And after all the hard work I put in to make him a good man, yeah. I'll be daggone if another sister gonna reap the effort of what I done turned around. Pride! Yeah. Pride 
will make you stay yeah. where God's trying to get you out. Yeah. Yeah. And so when pride is at work, watch what God does. God shows up to Samuel. Yeah. God makes a declaration and God asks a question. All right. Don't you miss it? He makes a declaration and he asks a question. Yeah. Right. Watch the declaration. He shows up to Samuel and he says, I have rejected him. Saul ain't my will for you. My hand ain't on that any longer. That's not what I called you to be in for the rest of your life. Saul's season is over. And David's destiny is about to begin. I want you to know I have rejected Saul. Yeah. Now, 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 now Brad, let me tell you why this is problematic. Because Samuel is a prophet. His number one job is to know what God's hand is on and what God's hand is off. So the question you ought to be asking, why come? Why come the Lord has to tell the prophet he's rejected Saul? A prophet should know that already. Why does the Lord have to tell Samuel I rejected Saul? Here it is. Because you can want something or someone so badly that you convince yourself it must be the will of God. And desire can cloud discernment. And when your desire has clouded your discernment, the Lord has to show up and give you undeniable evidence that his hand ain't on it no more. That's why it got crazy and deranged. That's why it broke your heart. That's why they disrespected you. That's why they called you out of your name. That's why it laid you on your sickbed. Because you wanted what God didn't want for you. And the Lord had to take you through something that made you slap yourself upside the head and recognize this cannot be God's will for my life. I don't know why I can preach you, but sometimes God's got to let it get ugly to get you out. Sometimes it's got to hurt for you to walk away. Sometimes it's got to break you for recognize this must not be what God has for me. So the Lord says, my hand ain't on it. And after the question, after the, the declaration comes the question. The question is this. So how long will you mourn over something God's hand ain't on? How long are you going to pray for something God already told you and showed you ain't in his will. How long you going to weep over something that wasn't in God's plan for your life anyhow? How long are you going to mourn for something God's hand ain't on? Now, now I, know, I know you, I know you cuz, I know your cousins go to my church. I know you, I know you, and some of you are looking at me and you're saying, Reverend, that, that's mighty insensitive of you. Um, because, you know, you, you come all the way down here to Kansas City and you got the audacity standing here to tell me to get over it. Um, you, you, you don't know how long I was in that. You, you, you don't know how deeply that hurt me. You, you, you don't know uh, what they said to me and how they treated me. You, you really don't know all the hell I went through. I'm, I, I'm still processed. I'm, I'm, I'm processing uh, my pain. And, and my therapist said I'm looking for closure over um, some issues that I've got to work out that I can't move on until I embrace my pain. And, and I did it. It hurt you. It broke you. It disappointed you. It was disrespectful. I understand that. But the question still remains. How long are you going to process? How long are you going to look for closure? How long are you going to sit idly by because
because life didn't turn out the way you wanted it to. Well, well, in order to help you, I started to do some research because the Bible says, watch me now, that, that, that Samuel began to mourn in chapter 15, verse 35. And in chapter 16, verse 1, the Lord showed up and asked, how long were you going to mourn? Right, right. In verse 15, verse 35, Samuel starts to mourn. In verse 6, chapter 15, verse 1, the Lord shows up and basically says, it's time to get over. Yeah. So the question you ought to be asking is how much time elapses from chapter 15, verse 35, to chapter 16, verse 1, so I know how long I get before the Lord shows up and tells me it's time to get over. Y'all with me? How much time goes by between chapter 15, verse 35, chapter 16, verse 1, so you know how much time God allows you to mourn over something he rejected? Well, 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 well I, 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 I'm not the best biblical style in the room. I'll tell you, I don't know the chronological answer. But let me give you the biblical answer. Yeah. You want to know how much time elapses from chapter 15, verse 35, to chapter 15, verse 1, so you know how long you got to get over it? Can I tell you how much time? One verse. Now, I don't know who I'm preaching to, but you got one verse to get this out your system. You got one verse to let it go and say bye bye. You got one verse to get over. Yeah. Yeah. Very Moses, there's Joshua. Yeah. Very Elijah, there's Elijah. 
Well, I thought I was in the Baptist church. I'm going to try that again. But God, God's next is always better than God's last. Eyes have not seen. Ears have not heard. The good things that God has in store for them. So we came by and tell somebody on Tuesday night, God's got another. And what he's got coming is better than what you had. Okay, I'm, I'm going to help you right here because somebody, you didn't even say amen. I, I can't let it go to you. At least say amen. I, I, got, I got to work. Um, I, I was raised uh, by the late Reverend Dr. Alvin John and Helene J. Weston. They were, they were old school parents. Who raised me in an old school house with some old school ways. Both my parents from, from down south, my dad in Louisiana, my mom in Mississippi. And and when I was born, my mama was over 40, my dad was close to 50. I, 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 I was the ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> so, so I was raised by some old school parents, an old school house with some old school ways. Let me tell you how old school our house was. That back is, there was no time out in our house. Now, time out was however long it took you to get up off the ground. After you got knocked out for talking back. Um, my, my parents did not believe in my First Amendment right for the freedom of speech. They taught us that children should be seen, not heard. And the kids, they got no place in grown folk conversation. But my mom and daddy old school, if, if they called you, you didn't say, huh, or what. The only appropriate response to keep your teeth in your mouth was yes, ma'am, and yes, sir. My, my mom was old school. She, she believed that a that a hard head. You go on. Make a soft behind. I try to say my mom was old school. My, my mama was racist. Yes, she was. Whenever I had trouble, she said she gonna slap the black off of me. We, we're old school. Since back as daddy raised us, told us every day. Long you live under my roof, yeah. you'll abide by my rules. I'm trying to tell you, 18 didn't mean nothing in my daddy's house. As long as you still live there, you did what he told you to do. We, we were so old school, y'all just gonna trip you out in your new way families. This we so old school that 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 we actually ate dinner at the dinner table. If you ask my daddy where we were going to dinner tonight, he said kitchen. <laughs> That's such. So when my mama cooked every night, she stayed at home mom, and she would start dinner early in the morning. She'd have dinner prepared, and we couldn't eat till daddy got home. We sit down at the table and lift up a prayer. And then we talk about how our day went. And mama would bring out all the food she'd been laboring to make all day long. Now, our house was old school, so when we sat down and we began to eat what mama had prepared, you couldn't just get up and leave the table. If you wanted to leave, you had to be excused. You had to raise your hand and say, ma'am, May I please be excused? And this is what I found out. Mama would never let you leave the table until you had tried everything she had prepared. And so you would sit there until she gave you what she'd been working on. And she never let you get up until you had tried what she prepared. You couldn't leave the table until you had everything she had prepared for you. You had to stay there until you tasted everything 
be worked out for you. Come here, let me talk to somebody who's slow. The reason your sin did not excuse you from the table of life last night because truth be told, you should have died in your sleep. But God did not excuse you from the table of life because he woke you up this morning to know that I still have something prepared for you. And you can't die until you get what I made for you. I wish I had a believer in this place who understood he prepared a table for me and sets me down and blesses me when I don't deserve it. you wake up, you ought to fill your horn with oil. Yeah. You ought to expect that God ain't through. Yeah. You ought to expect God's going to make a way. Yeah. You ought to expect God's going to do what he needs to do. Yeah. I don't know about you, but, 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 but I'm tired <laughs> of worshiping with folk every week. Right. Come in, sing hymns, clap hands, shout amen, Leave a dollar to an offering <laughs> and leave out of church yeah. not expecting God to do anything. Yeah. I need some folk yeah. who just believe yeah. that God didn't finish with me yet. Yeah. I'm looking for worshipers who say, I expect God to answer my prayer. Yeah. I expect God to make a way out of no way. Yeah. I expect in a closed door. I expect God to go exceedingly and abundantly above everything I ask of him. Is there anybody here on a Tuesday night who just expects God to do great things in your life? I, I gotta get on back to Alexandria. I'm, I, I got a deacon meet tomorrow. I'm, I'm going to miss the service. Dr. Branch, I apologize. I can't let my deacons meet without me. <laughs> not a good idea. It told me a long time ago, if you're not at the meeting, you are on the meeting. Yeah. He, said, he said, listen. He said, I want you to get over it. He said, I want you to get ready for something better. Then what he says, so after he says, and fill his heart oil, he says, now listen, this is what I do. I need you to go. Go down to Bethlehem. See, you can't start over staying here. The next chapter doesn't begin with you staying where you are. You got to make some moves. You got to do some things different. You got to fill out some new applications. You got to find you some new friends. Yeah. Gotta hang out in some new places. Yeah. Gotta do some things you ain't never done before. Yeah. You can't keep doing what you've been doing and expect to find a new thing from the Lord. Yeah. He says, you got to move. Yeah. Now, now I came out of argue Bible for you a little bit. Watch this. So the Lord tells Samuel to go down to Bethlehem and watch what Samuel says. He raises a valid objection. He says, Lord, I can't go to Bethlehem to find a king because there's no vacancy on the throne. Saul is still alive. Yeah. If Saul hears that I'm going to find a new king, yeah. Saul will kill me. Yeah. Watch attention. says, if I go pursue David and Saul finds out, Saul will kill me before I find David. Yeah. If I go try to get a new thing, there's some stuff in my old thing that if it creeps out, it'll kill me before I get my new thing. Yeah. Uh, uh, that, that as I pursue my David destiny, I got some stuff in my soul season that will destroy me now before I get where I'm trying to go. Can you hear me? Uh, Lord, I got some stuff in my yesterday that if it leaks out in my today, it'll kill my tomorrow. Okay, see, maybe you're not a sinner like I am. So I'm talking about myself. I got some stuff. I don't need the Lord to let out 
My father. Because cause if, if Doc knew what was in my soul, I wouldn't be standing here tonight. The way I see it, if the Lord ain't revealing it, who am I to confess it? Worship yeah. that God 
told Samuel to tell a lie. Mm. <laughs> because Samuel wasn't going down there to worship. Yeah. He was going to find David. Wow. And Brueggemann argues that God told Samuel to lie. Yeah. Now, now Brueggemann may have a PhD in Bible, yeah. but it's obvious he ain't ready. Yeah. <laughs> My Bible right. says that God is not a man. Yeah. It's a Bible reader here. Yeah. That he should tell you a lie. Yeah. You're the son of man that you have got. Ain't got to lie. Yeah. God did not tell Samuel to lie. Yeah, right. God told Samuel how to find David. Yeah. He said, This is what you do, son. Go down there I see, I see. and give me what I deserve. Yeah. Yeah. Go down there and right, give me an amen like you know I'm worthy. Yeah. Go down there and bless my name yeah. like you know I've been good to you. Yeah. Go down there and shout hallelujah for the ways that I made. Go down there and testify that if it had not been for the Lord on my side, I don't know where I'd be. Go down there and praise my name. And when you praise me and worship me, you ain't got to find David. If you're in the hood where I'm from, 